everybody. Welcome back to Improv FAQ at Length. This is a series of longer conversations about improv topics that have lots of questions surrounding them. And this is part two of our conversation with our good friend Isaac Kessler. And we've been talking about his story uh, coming up in improv and where his path crossed with the world of clown. And so we're going to be digging deeper into that topic in part two of our conversation. Uh, so, yes, to go back to it, you train, you train the body, you you train in, and you were mentioning it, James, and something I, I would like to research in my life, which I will soon. But yes, I would believe that Lecoq had a background in athletics in some way. One of the foundations of the Lecoq pedagogy is something called the, the 20 movements. And um, just so you know, like quickly, my background, uh, I never did any of these two-year programs. So I studied with Paola. Uh, multiple times. These were like three or four day workshops. And then uh, in 2011, this guy, Philippe Gaulier from uh, France came to Toronto to teach a two week workshop. My friend Jess told me about him, said, I think you'd like this. So I was like, okay. And, and he became <laughs> really well known because uh, at the time, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen had come out and said, I'm nothing without Philippe Gaulier. So this is like the time of Ali G and Borat. Um, I, yep. I love Sasha. Oh my God, I love Sasha. Oh my God. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, all right, I want to do this. So I signed up, absolutely changed my life in a way that I've never experienced because I didn't learn anything. <laughs> like I had no idea what I learned. I left every day getting the shit kicked out of me and laughing and every day loving, loving everything about life and not knowing what I had learned. Later on, I've realized, oh my God, he taught us so many tools, theatrical tools. That I didn't realize what he was teaching at the time. It was 2011. He taught Buffon. He taught Buffon, which is a okay. style of theater. He taught Buffon for two weeks. So in fact, whereas my life is a lot of clown and all these things, I really, you know, I did improv and I learned about long form and all this, but my first foray into European theater, this is my journey, was Buffon. And I've only realized that last year, how impactful the work of Buffon is to me as a performer, more than even clown. Um, and then in 2012, Philippe came back to Toronto and taught clown for two weeks. I did red nose clown with him. Uh, and so maybe we, maybe we could take a quick moment to, to just, yeah. uh, go ahead, Bob. I was going to ask, um, I, I've, I've heard of Buffon only because Sasha Barrett Cohen has used it as an example of yes. his style where he's like talking to Mark Marin. Can yeah. you give an explanation for the listeners? Like, yeah. how, how, cause my understanding is more like an antagonist mm -hmm. type situation where you're trying to undermine uh someone with high status by impersonating them or or or, or almost mirroring some some aspect of their personality they don't see but I, again i'm i i've only heard a couple interviews about it so and, well, and one of the first things more. we should say to just kind of preface and, and contextualize the the conversation as we get deeper into it is that uh, th uh clown uh Clown in general is something that is almost, um, it's like part of the spirit of clown is to be undefinable. Um, uh, and so it's really hard to pin down exactly what clown is and yeah. is not. Um, and so we're going to be talking about it, I think, more in, 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 a, in a general sense as an umbrella of uh, physical theater, um, performance work and that these specific uh, subcategories we, we should probably uh, define to the best of our ability while, while at the same time uh, we say that like clown is um, it can be can, can really include a lot <laughs> and and we and, and by the time uh, we're done with this conversation things that we're calling clown might not be clown anymore you know what I mean that's a very good point <laughs> a very good point because we joke a lot about this in LA because I I discovered a beautiful clown community uh, when I went to LA four and a half years ago. And a lot of my friends, we talk about like, man, if anybody says they know what clown is, they don't know what fucking clown is. Cause I don't know if anybody knows what clown is. Cause every teacher, you know, they'll know yeah. what clown is and they're right. 
everybody's right. And like you said, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's the there's the American circus clown. That's the noun. That's like a that's like what that kind of clown is as a character. But then you've got you've got red nose mask. You got the pedagogy of teaching the red nose clown. But then you've got this energetic idea of a person of they're such a clown. <laughs> and I yep. I'm not standing behind anything of any of my definitions about Buffon or anything. It's just things in my brain that are coming out. Uh, you know, there are so many resources and things to learn about what all this stuff is. Because, yes, absolutely. <laughs> you will finish this and be like, I don't know if that was really. <laughs> yeah, like you said, I don't learn anything. Yeah, but <laughs> like, I'm interested. Like I, I, yeah. one of my mentors is I, I tour Basauri and I tour is a uh, he's Basque, <laughs> which is uh, in Spain. And he is, uh, well, one of the funniest people I've ever met, one of the best teachers and directors. I've been blessed to study with him multiple times. I've been blessed to be directed by him. He's a genius. I love him. And he will say, he teaches Buffon clown. He mostly teaches clown. He'll say, ja, I suck, you know, <laughs> you know, Buffon for me, you know, it's good, but you know, I'm more like the clown. But Philippe is very good at the Buffon, you know? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> like, whatever, man. I don't know. Like, how do you even, but there is a difference to him and Philippe. There's a big difference. And a... Well, what, and what is the, what is it to you to go back to Bob's question is, is like when you distinguish what you learn from clown or what you identify with in clown versus Buffon, what, what, are, what are, how are you, your, how is your experience defining those two? Uh, my own you want my personal experience or what what yeah, yeah i think that's all, i think that's all we can get <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but yeah what what like what is uh cuz you were you were talking about um uh the uh, learning uh buffon um and uh sorry what what was the guy's name who came to to toronto and you eventually went Philippe, to Philippe Gaulier, Gaulier. so F Philippe is is doing Buff buffon and and um and so uh, at this point, looking back on it, um, how are how are you kind of distinguishing what you learned as Buffon through uh, Philippe um, versus any any other experience with Clown that you have had up to this point? Uh, very good, very good. May I just say something real quick here? A little timeline things for everybody. So yeah, this is like Lecoq, Jacques Lecoq, right here, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody was like Jacques Lecoq's right here, Philippe Gaulier becomes a student at Lecoq school and okay. does really shitty, has a hilarious story about it, then then succeeds and becomes friends with Lecoq and begins to teach at the school and then begins to have his own ideas and wants to push it further. So he he leaves and starts his own school called Ecole Philippe Gaulier. Now, meanwhile, actually before this, he's still teaching at Lecoq and then Paola Coletto comes in as a student uh, Philippe is one of her teachers at one point. And then he breaks out and goes to his own school. Paola becomes a teacher. I tour, I think I tour, I know for sure I tour studied under Philippe and then taught uh, when Philippe like had a stroke, he taught for Philippe. So um, just so everybody knows there's this, uh, the, like this lineage in a sense of uh, Lecoq and Philippe becoming friends, studying under Lecoq and then leaving to break away to start his own school, which um, again, like one of the two, you want to be a theater creator, you go to Jacques Lecoq or you go to Gaulier. And Gaulier okay. really blew up with uh, the Sacha Baron Cohen stuff. So just to say that. Okay. Now back to okay. the question about me. Um, do you want to know about Buffon and what it is first, or do you want me to just tell you what I feel the difference is? Like, let's start with, let's start with what, what the what you, how are you defining Buffon and then, and then go to the if difference between yeah. clown and Buffon. Yeah. Um, well, this is hard. Um, um, so this idea of, um, <laughs> for me, as it was my first real experience learning European pedagogy and it was Buffon, the energy of the Buffon is that of parody and satire. And I, 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 that's not really the thing that. 
we talked we talked about this you you were you were in uh new york doing a show yeah. and we had a great conversation about uh buffon after after the show trying to have this same conversation of how it's defined one of the things i found most helpful is you describing it as like the the lowliest um sort of jester uh trying to parody and satire the highest seat of power uh without getting in trouble so so um to uh kind of mock uh high power um in in a way that toes the line between being insulting <laughs> yeah and that's exactly why yeah that's why i mentioned the history thing prior to me saying my experience because that's exactly that's exactly what it is right and that you know that's why it was helpful to hear that just now because it's this idea of you are the lowliest piece of shit you are handicapped you are whatever you have multiple problems and you are allowed one time of the year to come out in front of the upper class and the royalty to perform for them and you pretend like you said to be the upper class without them knowing you're making fun of them and you have to make them laugh at every moment and if they don't laugh they're going to stone you and they have to leave this show after laughing, going home to their palaces, getting ready for bed, looking at themselves in the mirror. And they have to laugh and look and say, oh, my God, what a lovely time at theater we had. Wait a second. They are making fun of me. And then you kill yourself. <laughs> That's because <laughs> so, you are so duped into, into not knowing they are making fun of you. And then the Buffon slowly go back into the swamp where they live because they are the rejects and the outcasts. And so this ties into Two Man No Show. Uh, this ties into Two Man No Show because Ken and I have always bonded over being the underdogs. And the theme under that very first show, which we ever did together was, we want to be the underdogs. We've, we'd always, in our personal life experiences, Ken, for people who don't know, uh, has severe scoliosis curvature of the spine and has like 48 bone grafts steel titanium in his spine oh wow i didn't know that yeah yeah many no. many surgeries up until he was 14 i think um wow. and ken is he's another guy to talk to he's uh you know i think he'd be okay he's 15 years sober um he's a he used to be a drummer for a punk rock band and um went back to school became sober and um and uh, uh became a career counselor and then discovered creative writing and improvisation and is one of the most brilliant actors and improvisers you're ever going to see ever and physical performer and would also take every class that I produce and we always learn together. So we went on this journey together. So I, I say that because Ken and I always feel like the underdogs and kind of like end up like that. And so we want to do a show that showed the beautiful journey and the victory of the underdog. And I think that's something about Buffon that really connected with me. It's this, you're dressed on stage, teeth are all blacked out, black fucking paint. You, uh, Philippe puts you under different handicaps. So you have one day where you're, you're all uh, amputees and you don't have arms or legs. You can have uh, hunchbacks, you can have huge bellies. Um, and you have to be in this uncomfortable position on stage and... Um, still find the mockery of the audience without them knowing. And so anyways, with this idea of Buffon, for me, it's this presence on stage of such, there's always something behind the eye of the Buffon. The, the Buffon always welcomes the audience, is always so nice to greet you, and always tries to go a little bit further. And if you get, if you, if you come back a bit, the Buffon goes back too and says, ah, oh, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> you're absolutely yeah. right. That, that, was, uh, that, was, that was too far. That was too far. You're, you're the best. And then the audience says, thank you, I am. And then they come forward. So the idea is how close can you get to the audience as a Buffon before they realize what you're doing? How close can you get to them? What's the charade? You know, how can you draw them in without pushing them away while pushing so far in, it's, it's so toying the line. It is so playing at the edge of our abilities in Buffon, I feel. Because mm. it's a really 
It's about connection and tension. It's a with connection the and, a, and, a, and a tension, and it's a, a, a connection to the audience. And clown is as well. I'm going to say something that I don't even know if it's true or not <laughs> for me, but <laughs> clown is very hard for me to do in class. Uh, the, the stripping away, uh, there's something about it that is – you really got to, you got to listen, the vulnerability. It's always hard for me to do it in class. And, and there's something, there's just something that I think I connect to in Buffon that is, I, I think it may connect to like rage. I think it may connect to <laughs> this idea of not, I'm not angry when I do it, but the being, the being the bully, the being the put down, the thoughts that I have about myself connect to me as a Buffon. And then when I'm on stage, like how close can I? Now I'm in a place where I'm on stage in front of an audience. How close now? Now you're going to give me my chance <laughs> not to get back at you because that's not what I want to do as an audience. And that's not what Philippe is training you to do. That You got to make them laugh. But how can you mock society? You know, how can I mock the bullies? How can I heal others and myself through laughter and pushing that line? You know what I mean? And, and some people, yeah, yeah and, and that's uh, perhaps in a sense, I find so much joy in being ugly and disgusting and being so, I love to push that line. And I think that's where I really fell in love when I did Buffon, because there was something about it connected with me to the parts of improv that I fell in love with. That, that style that I do, which is that big physicality and the big characters and really pushing it. How far can I push it? And not that I don't give a fuck. I give every fucks, but I also don't give a fuck. Yeah. And I want to push it so far. It's like I'm being such a fucking dick, but I'm always listening, hopefully, to know. I will always know what's going on, I hope, but I'm always going to push it so far. And how can I far can I push you? How far can I push myself to be better, you know, to make the audience laugh and enjoy and leave feeling changed in a different way, you know? So, Isaac, yeah. uh, you've watched some uh, Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah. Have you ever seen that um, that uh, that scene he did where he is Borat and he goes to Nashville and he learns how to become a country singer? And he and he goes and does an open mic, and he gets the whole audience to sing the song with him. Throw the and, Jew and down like, the well. Throw the Jew down the well. Yeah. So my yes, country yeah. can be free. Be free. <laughs> That's the example and I use, Bob. Yeah. Okay. That's oh. the example I use for Buffon because to me that's Buffon. To me, it is such. It's a. It's a. So it's like so many layers right now, and it's weird because Borat and Sasha have a lot of clown aspects and all the characters is what we're talking about. Right? right, you don't really know what it is, but Buffon to me is going in to a bar and making them Amer. I just say this. I'm just say it this way: you're making Americans in laughter and joy sing "Throw the Jew Down the Well" so my country can be free, <laughs> laughing without any idea that it could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> having, yeah, having Americans who are still under the umbrella of the country of America, watch this on TV and laugh and then realize, wait a second, those people are Americans and I'm an American. Yep. Am I a racist, an anti-Semite? Wait a second. And wait, that guy's a Jew? <laughs> like, wait a second. Sasha Barrett, there's so many layers to Buffon in that in that piece that I, I think is, ab it's so... That guy could have been shot so many times. I mean, there's oh, yeah. so My God. many things. Bore, like Sasha is a genius in that sense. Somehow, he, he survived to this day. But and but it's and it's that mi mission. It's it is like it's very much like un going undercover because and uh, playing that connection and tension with the audience and and finding where that line is because that that line is the difference between going back to the historical thing of. Uh, doing doing the show and uh, having the message sink in on some level or be taken away or getting crossing the line and getting stoned. <laughs> <laughs> and also right. I think about now, like, you know, Bob, he was he was dressed like a clown, you know, and clown, you know, either Philippe will say, OK, you will be the, uh, the butcher 
uh, you, James, will be the, uh, you will be the boxer. <laughs> so he would give you uh, the clown um, character. Other teachers, and also Philippe too, will say, um, you go to go away, come back, and you have to wear the most stupid costume that'll make you feel the most stupid. What's going to make you feel that? And if we come to class and we come out and we present ourselves, and it's not, then they say, no, no, this isn't stupid enough. <laughs> come back next class with an even stupider <laughs> costume. And so something about Borat and, Ali and, and Sasha were like, he's such an idiot. He, he, he finds the costume. He finds the voice. He finds the look, which makes him such an idiot and a beautiful idiot and a clown with Borat. But... And like even how he talks, like yeah, it's nice and like it's so you make it's so much joy, yeah. stupidity. But in what he's doing, it's so grotesque. It is so horrible. It's so disgusting. Oh man, he's making doing. Paul Abdul sit down in human beings and yeah, yeah. like <laughs> like you're real people. And it's yeah. brilliant, right? Like it's so brilliant, you know, of what he was able to do through. It's kind of like Chaplin, right? Like the Great Dictator. Yeah. How, you know, Chaplin go. Oh yeah. Makes light. I, I I love Taika Waititi. I haven't seen Jojo Rabbit, but I know hey, that guy told the line. Oh my God! With with Jojo Rabbit, where you can create such beauty and comedy through through something that is so, you know, risque to talk about. But he's, he found the way to do it. He's a genius, in my opinion. Yeah. So maybe, okay, so let me, uh, I went down the same history timeline that it sounds like you've done, Isaac, and, and maybe between the two of us, we can kind of draw a loose path between some of this uh, old historical stuff uh, to now. Because my, my feeling is that um, improv, in a way, um, is a type of modern clown. Um, and, uh, and if not, at least has the potential to lean more that way. Uh, because when I went looking for like the history and the different eras of clown, uh, what I found is that, um, yeah, you've got, you've got comedia, um, and, and, and uh, you'll have to help me out here, Isaac, but you got, you got Comedia, um, and then in no particular order, what's the uh, like Augusti, uh, uh, the first like red nose clown? Um, uh, I might yes. be mixing, um, I, I might be conflating some things. Um, but then there's 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 circus uh, yes, clown. Yes, yes, uh, the uh, the white face and the um, shit. Yeah, keep going. Circus clown. But but the, uh, well, yeah yeah yeah. There, there, there's um oh yeah yeah. So so there's like white and red clown right where there's yes. like red, high stat yes. high status low status clown. Yeah. Um and then there's a circus clown where the 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 modern uh maybe misrepresentation of uh what people think of when they think of clown uh comes from uh, circus clown having to perform in these very large um, stadiums and circus tents where uh, the, the um, the audience is so far back that you have to wear makeup to accentuate uh, expressions and also big shoes and wigs and stuff to just get people's attention from that far away. Um, and then you also have uh, the uh, vaudeville style clown. Um, and then and then when you start to see cinema, then you have like this idea of tramp and the chap the chaplain clown that starts to uh, get adapt itself to being on camera um and then there's kind of this weird um evolution where yeah uh also buffon and uh grotesque clown are somewhere in that timeline as well uh but but uh there's also um like stand-ups um and uh just this constant evolution and adaptation of clown uh reinventing itself on, on like a um, societal level um, to adapt to new mediums and within means so that it can reach uh, an audience um, from a lack of like a lack of means um, or with that low status. And I think that improv being a medium where you're performing on a blank stage without costumes and props and, um, the background of like uh, Second City being like satirical uh, and still being about like peep the people's theater and um, 
a current event satire. It it has that spirit of clown and uh, a special brand of of physical theater, or again, at least a potential for physical theater because of the um, imagination aspect of not having set pieces, costumes, and props. Mime is also somewhere in uh, that timeline. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, I, I don't know. Uh, right, yeah. yeah. So, so do, do, do you feel what I'm, what I'm saying, though, Isaac, is that there's these kind of like evolutions and pivots where Clown uh, reappears or, or re- and reinvents itself um and and it, it appears in in uh each era in this different representation and i was tracing this timeline being like i think modern clown is presenting itself in improv in a lot of ways very good very good yes yes I just, oh, thank you thank you thank you and, and as you're talking <laughs> well i just want to like a real quick look down and yeah, it's it's incredible how it does pop up in in Commedia dell'arte. It, it, interesting, I just read it's like Arlecchino, Arlecchino, the Harlequin was almost uh, something very clown like. That then in 1801, Joseph Grimaldi, who had Auguste, is the character you're talking Auguste, about. Yeah. Auguste, the f- first white face clown. He's ah. the first person to use the white face on the clown was Joseph Grimaldi. At this point, I'm like, okay, I don't know. I got to really do my research, but absolutely. Because, you know, this thing about the French and Pierrot and these characters coming up, Auguste and performance that come from Commedia dell'arte. And then you've got all of a sudden this idea of uh, uh, in the 18, uh, you're going to help me out here. Uh, I'm not happy about myself right now. What year was America founded? Wait, 1776? Is that the one? Is that George Washington? Yeah. Are you thinking of the Civil War in the 1800s? 1845 or whatever? No. I'm talking about no. Washington. 1776. Right? 1776. Right, Bob? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Come on, man. So it's, this is like very interesting. It comes <laughs> up, right? Like, now, 1801 was Grimaldi. And Auguste, yep. right? And yet, when I was at the Clown Circus Museum in Sarasota, stuff was happening prior to George Washington in America. A lot of shit was happening in France and England. England would get it from France. And this idea, these clown characters and this type of theater would come in until like, it made its way over to America before it was America in what they would have before the circus was the cavalry would do shows. And because to make it more, you know, they would do it in the round because the only way to stand up on a horse was to have centrifugal force. So you have to make the horse go in a circle and they have these acrobats. And there was a dude who came from, I think, England, who Philippe talks about, as the first clown, where he would come around and he actually visited America. And what he would do is he would dress like a tramp because he realized hey, you know, my shit isn't like really hitting as hard. I'm going to dress like a tramp with tattered clothing, like a hobo. And what's going to happen is like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then he would fall off the horse into a somersault land, take off his costume. And he'd be a beautiful, you know, in the, in the captain's cavalry. And he would do all his acrobats on the horse. And so this idea of playing this clown then developed into this round, into the circus, into, into George Washington saying, this is something everybody has to go to. This is something. And this is right wow. when America was formed, that then they built the railroads. They built the railroads for the circus. That's why they built the fucking railroad. Like it was entertainment that got the railroads made so that the people of America would be happy, not even to get food across. Like it was for the circus. It's crazy. And within the circus, these these famous performers and the comedy of the circus was the clown. And then these different characters that of course came from like the British and French and the white and the hobo clown, the tramp clown, 
Yes. And there is also this book about improv, which I haven't read, very thick book, just came out a few years ago about the history of improv. I've heard that, this is something I want to talk about too. I've heard that, um, so Spolin, yeah, like Spolin, Viola, she, I, 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 I've got to butcher this. I'm going to butcher this. It's either Spolin or somebody before her learned about games for children working at an orphanage in Europe somewhere. These kids games, that how, do, how do I make 46 orphans be happy? And that became the base, the foundation of theater games, mm-hmm. which is what Viola Spolin's book oh. is about, games for theater. And I wanted to say this, which I haven't said yet. With Golier, what I learned in 2011 that blew my mind was that at the foundation of all of this training in this style of theater is called le jeu. And le jeu is the game. Le jeu is play. And what blew my mind was that when you go to Golier, when you go to Lecoq, you learn le jeu. That's the first thing you learn before neutral mask, everything is le jeu. And as you learn le jeu, you can't ever just learn it and you're good. You, you, le jeu is at the basis of everything. That, you know, you work with Philippe neutral mask, you work Greek chorus, you work bouff, bouffons later, it's very hard. So you do like melodrama in second year, you do Shakespeare, but everything is with le jeu. Everything is with the play. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to learn Shakespeare as a Shakespearean actor. You're learning le jeu, and then you do it. And when you learn le jeu at Golier and at Lecoq, you don't learn zip, zap, zop as, hey, everybody, let's get up and do zip, zap, zop. Now sit down and let's do some improv. <laughs> you don't do it like that. <laughs> up, You get up, and you ha- you do... You know, as if you, you, you connect, you are so intent in your body and connected to everybody in that, in that room, in this connection, you feel the energy, you feel the rhythm, you feel the play and you can't go on until you start to be able to get that, to get that play every time you're on stage, to feel that energy of play, of le jeu. Then you do Shakespeare with le jeu. So I just yeah. want to say that le jeu is such a huge part because that to me is the games that Spolin plays is the le jeu are the games that we learn in improv when we're starting out. And, and that to me blew my mind because then I'm like, Oh, I couldn't watch improv after studying with Philippe because I can't watch it if there's no play anymore. Yeah, it's interesting because, and and I think it is fair to say that that of all the things that are so hard to define about clown, that uh, sense of play is definitely the consistency, right? Is that that is the the element of it, and that uh, that involves um, being in a uh, a a live a lively energetic uh, state of play, and then sharing that moment and connection or, 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 or using it to reach other people, uh, and bring them into that sense of play. And I think that what, you, what, uh, I'm connecting with and what you're saying, Isaac is, is that, yeah, it, se- it seems like that's obviously in the roots of modern improv. Um, but it seems like in, um, there's also the, the uh, a tendency or a push to, to kind of like puzzle out the dialogue and get it closer and close closer to sketch, um, where, uh, uh, it, it might make more sense or to, to have at least a, another branch of it that gets farther and farther from sketch so that you're tapping into the things that don't translate uh, or aren't repeatable or, or so uh, objective about um, improv. And I think that that's something that's present in your style of play, Isaac, and in yeah. Two Man No Show is those um, those those things that you had to be there for in the best way that like – it, it capitalizes on the on the real people in the real room and the the mysterious magical energy that is connecting everybody um, throughout the show and in these spikes of discovery together as that that you can't you can't uh, transfer and carry over to 
putting on on paper um, or on camera. It's 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 hard to catch that lightning in a bottle. And um, improv has this uh, embedded opportunity to have that present in shows, but it, it seems that the more dominant style is is to get it closer and closer to being um, something that feels like a, like a written show or, or scripted theater, um, yet it's improvised, which is interesting. Yeah, th- um, thank you for saying that. I, I do appreciate that. Um, and it's interesting, I, at Lecoq, you don't talk for the first year. There's no, everything you create, everything you train in, there's no dialogue, there's no talking. So I just like was thinking as you're saying, I'm like, man, when you go to study this kind of training, you got to like, you work your body, you work le jeu, you work the game, you learn the 20 movements, which tie into mime and acrobatics and this kind of training. You learn about your body and space. You learn neutral mask. You don't learn it to be funny. You learn it to feel before anything, what it feels like to be present on stage, to find neutrality so that you can play anything. Eventually you're allowed to talk. <laughs> Eventually. And <laughs> and then once you get there, it all just tanks. Cause once you start when you put the mask on, like you have you have neutral, then you have lar uh, before larval, you have uh, animals and uh, colors and materials and elements. So the you wear a mask of earth and air and water and fire and you breathe like fire and you move like fire and you move like a candle and you move like a forest fire and you move like a placid puddle and then you move like you're in a typhoon and you breathe like that and you go in between and then you learn how to move like a rainbow and that shit is so weird. <laughs> Let me That's tell you so how fucking weird it is to be like, you're not moving like orange. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and I had my breakthrough in colors. I will say I really had a breakthrough in colors. And then you learn animals, which I love. You got to go to the zoo and you got to watch an animal and see it and come back and you got to be an orangutan. So I just want to say that also, once you get past that, you go to larval, which is a completely amorphous blob shape with the most subtle movements, with beginning to have expression and theatricality and scene work. And then you go to half mask, which you're allowed to do gibberish. When they have, they have very expressive, I'm sorry, expressive mask. So it's weird, like bulging, very cartoonish, but only gibberish. And you're doing scenes and it's really hard. Then you go half mask which are even more human, uh, humane-like and have actual, like they look like they're humans. And then you can almost speak in real words. That's gotta be gibberish. <laughs> it's gotta be gibberish. But then you got, but then you can speak. Yeah. And then, I don't know. I mean, it depends what, how you want to teach it, your pedagogy. But like in the second year, you do the red nose, the clown, because at this point you've gone through two years. Wow. Doing all this physical training all this, you know how you stand, you know how to be present, you know how to have complete pay with your partner and yourself in the audience, you know how to listen, you know how to move and be light on stage. Then you do clown, <laughs> which is so hard. And it's almost like that's what you're, not you, but that's what, that's what teachers, uh, that's what some people teach improv like. They say, okay, get up. Uh, let's do zip zap zop. Let's do eights, and then go up and do genius theater with talking. And I'm like, how can you? That's like going through five years of training in, in like the first twelve minutes of class, and no one's, you know what I mean. So that's why it's it, it's 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 improv is a beautiful and the most beautiful art form because also in the school of Lecoq and Goulier, it's all improv. All we're doing and nothing is written. Everything is made up. All the jeu, all the, the things you do and talking to, you know, and playing, it's all made up on the spot. So you have to put yourself into it as well. So, I, you know, to say what you're saying, I, I do appreciate it, James, because uh, there's something magical about improv that in a class on stage, you had to be there. You know what I mean? And whether we know we're doing it or not, when those performers on stage, two or many, 
find themselves with such commitment and play in that moment, you just, you can't, you can't recreate it. It's so beautiful. And, and it's everything. It's the shapes they're making on stage. It's the sounds they're making. It's the context. It's the game yeah. play and the narrative. There's a story and there's game. There's legit behind it. And there's theater that's being created. And it's magic, man. It's absolute magic. But it's a real hard journey. And people got to be really easy on themselves. And then realize you've never gotten to your point where you've learned it. You can always yeah. learn more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, just to kind of um, reframe the point I was uh, saying earlier, because I, I don't want to make it sound like I think it's a negative thing that people are doing like sketch like or scripted play like improv. I, I just feel like um, that's, that's been very successful. And um, I think more, traveled than leaning into the other side of like what if we said fuck it to the to like what's going on in the uh text of the dialogue and just uh played up the physical and uh con connected uh like attention energy um in in the room um and so I so I think I'm curious, Isaac. Like, um, it, with with the style that that uh, you have, that that you and Ken have, um, what would you like to see more of, or what would you suggest that that people uh, pursue if this conversation is something that people made it this far into um, and are uh, interested in? Um, how can you kind of like? open yourself up more to this style of play or, or seek it out? Um, well, what, one, one, one thing I will say, and I, we've said it before on this show is that if, you, if people get a chance to go see two man, no show <laughs> all the time. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Two man, no show. Um, S and P too, man. I mean, those, those, we, we don't get to play very much cause, uh, we just don't, I live in LA most of the time, but we got to play Ottawa yeah. and it was just, Magic playing with those guys. Um, what would I like to, I mean, first of all, seek out more. God, that's a great question. Seek out. Uh, I, I, it's hard now at this time. Totally. Of pandemic. You know what I yeah. mean? But my, my, my Paola, she, she, I spoke to her and she said, uh, she said, this happened. I said, no way. I'm never going to teach online. <laughs> like, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, the way she does it, how the hell is she going to get a broom handle behind your back? How are you going to lie down on a broom handle to find your neutrality of your spine? You know, how are you, how are you going to do that yeah, right. from a Zoom call? How is she going to be able to see your body when you're in a neutral mask? How are you going to feel your people behind you as you enter when the audience wants you to enter? on a zoom call unless you have a blue yeah. headset. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so seek it out. There are still things that uh, uh, Dean Evans is teaching mime weekly in LA. Um, I haven't really done the research of who else. I know it's a lot of people probably doing online classes, but mime work, you know, I'll tell you, mime sucks. <laughs> okay. Mime, <laughs> mime oh, sucks. Shots fired. Shots fired. Wow. And I'll tell you something. Hard stance on I, miming. I'll tell you something. I fucking love mime. Okay. So I say <laughs> mime is dead. Long live mime, baby. Okay. Because when, when you got like Dean Evans teaching mime, it's fantastic. You know, and my teacher in the school was fantastic. When you got somebody teaching you mime, you're going to go in thinking mime sucks. But if you can be open to mime work, not the mime work we get taught in improv, not not go up on stage. Uh, you have to mime a cup better. When you begin to learn the European style of where mime comes from, from corporeal mime and from Jacques Copot and Marcel Marceau, it is such a beautiful art form. You will see your performance increase dramatically on stage with mime. Because that's where a lot of this physical work comes from with Macaque. It's from the mime. Like when you realize how many different rotations and inclinations your body can do, you have triple design. So you separate into five points here, boom, up, 
and everything is a different emotional moment. So anyway, yeah. mime is amazing. Do some mime during the quarantine. Um, uh, 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 like in yeah, well, honestly, honestly, that's something like I, I always tell yeah. students, like if you're looking for things that you can practice at home on your own, uh, mime and object work is one of them. And if if nothing else, if, if it's not uh, going to fully engage your sense of play, just getting uh, articulation and, and some dexterity down in, in your uh, movements is a skill set that you can hone and be better prepared to play with uh, once you do train it. Can I say something? So with that, during this time, what I've found for myself, healing, dance, 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 dance is even, you know, it's, it's where mask started, you know, it's even made before mask. It's like, it was dance, man. And it was also the music. It was the musicality. It was the mixture of the, the drumming and the percussion and the rhythm. The, it's something primal about percussion and dance and movement that so many people are shy about. But if you can be by yourself, you can follow along, you know, Ryan Heffington, I love him. He's really saved me this, this quarantine. If you can dance more, dance, man, like dance, baby, because dance is play. It is the body. It is movement. It is musicality. And to me, when you're on stage, you you know, you're dancing. When you're in play, learning le jeu, it's a dance. When you're with your scene partner, you're watching this beautiful dance, you know? And and I think that is such a beautiful way to be in our bodies and to make sure we stretch and to be stronger and more flexible and mobile and to know what we can do. Because once I learned what I could do with my body, my performance and the way I presented myself really changed because... I didn't want to get up on stage anymore and be like, I don't want to be on stage and have a moment of thinking, I can't do that. I want to know I can do that. I want to know my body can handle it and know my limits. And I'm going to push that because when I'm pushing myself to the limit, the audience is going to feel that too, you know? And yep. so I will say, you asked me too, like what, what, what can, what can people do more? Or what do I want to see more of? Uh, I, you know, to understand, uh, I want to see the fourth wall being broken. I want to see the fourth wall being broken. The fourth wall is not a bad thing. The fourth wall is a great thing. Huge. I love it. Love the fourth wall. Okay, it's a lovely thing. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fourth wall. Shots fired on the fourth wall. All right. I, like, the fourth wall is beautiful, right? It's just fascinating. Uh, our conversation, the beautiful conversation we've just had, uh, it's like entertainment started. Without one, entertainment started in this in this country, at least in America, without a fourth wall. Uh, in the circus, you know, even when people create theater and the lights go down, lights come up, you can perform. Not that there's, you don't have to like be facing the audience and looking at them and do all this shit, but you can be with your partner on stage and you can breathe in and, and understand that there is a world out there watching you in that room with you in that moment and listen to them and listen to your partner and listen to yourself and be open to giving them what they want and giving yourself what you want and giving your partner what they want. So just, I would love to see people do that more. And I think if people started really being open to what they, what brought them joy and if they were really open to what is my partner doing? How can I bring my partner joy? If they were listening to how can I bring the audience joy in this moment? There's a beautiful cocktail that is made in theater where all of a sudden you're up on stage and you know, you're fucking humping a chair because you know what? I feel I really want to hump this chair in the context of whatever. <laughs> and my partner supporting it and that's what he wanted. And then the audience they're loving it and they're laughing. So I'm going to keep doing it. So all of us are kind of getting what we want in this moment. Whereas a lot of times people aren't really listening to that. They're listening to perhaps what a teacher is saying. Uh, yes. Say, you know what I mean? It's like, no, I have to do yeah. this. It, 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 I, I want to see people be free. I want to see people yep. be free and I want to see them dream. Cause probably the most, the beautiful thing, most beautiful thing that Philippe ever taught me, and all of us is that um, 
if you go on stage and you have a dream, you create a dream in the audience. And that's, it's still the most beautiful thing he's ever said, which is you have to go on stage to dream. And you won't dream every night, but when you're on stage and you're dreaming, everybody in the audience will dream with you and you create a whole world for them. And it's absolute mm -hmm. magic, you know? And, you know, he said somebody comes up and plays Richard the third or whatever in this show and he dreams. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, I feel like I can do that and I can be free in my life and be like this. And the next night he doesn't dream that he's Richard the <laughs> third. And then he eats shit and he's terrible. But that's how it works. Yeah. But as long as we can go out and, and do our best to dream, you know, I think that we can heal people. And we, we know that, especially in improv, we have the choice of every moment to do whatever we want. So why not take every moment to dream and heal and share with the audience and bring laughter and vulnerability? Yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I, I do hope that was beautiful. <laughs> I do hope that um, in the unfortunate time that we are unable to uh, physically surround ourselves with with uh, other people and, and engage in theater in this way, that uh, once we are able to do that in a way that is uh, safe, um, that we overcompensate for what we've been missing out on during this time, yeah. uh, which is to make more use of movement and physicality um, and carry all the great things about the verbal aspect that we've been sustaining um, o over the virtual improv and uh, couple it with um, uh, a stronger return to physical theater. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, the guy who uh, introduced me to Clown, who is Anthony Corser. Um, and uh, Leah um, Erzendowski Corser. Um, Anthony taught my Clown Day of a physical theater intensive at Second City uh, a long time ago. And um, kind of like you were saying, Isaac, I reached out to them a couple years later to work with, uh, to come to, to come to the Metro Detroit community and, and teach, uh, so some workshops that go and, uh, yeah, to work, fun. work with a group that I was directing and they took the leap and, and did it. I didn't really, I didn't know Anthony, um, beyond just taking the class, but I, but I reached out and they came and, uh, Anthony and Leah, uh, put people through the, the physical theater boot camp of, of a couple of workshops and, um, so if, if you're, I think, I believe they're still based out of Chicago. Uh, those, those might be somebody that, to seek out workshops with. Um, and, uh, I love clowns, man. Beautiful clowns. Yeah. I'll just go everywhere and share. <laughs> yeah. And I'm so happy that we had this time to talk and that we were able to, to really live yes. up to the name of talking at length about wow. <laughs> the subject of, of clown and your Sorry, style guys. and your story. So, <laughs> man, I yeah. loved it. Oh, Wow. Yeah, yeah. We, we can do this for another hour. I'm, yeah. I'm in it. Yeah. Well, we talked in we talked in between that that like this conversation is not going to be for everybody, um, right. and the the topic uh, probably doesn't appeal to everybody, and um, that's okay. W what this conversation is for is, I think, uh, uh, people who have this restless something that they can't quite put their finger on that have heard this conversation and go, Oh shit. I think that's the thing I need to seek out in order to open me up because I'm feeling like Isaac was saying, or like James has said, and that might be the thing that, that I need. And hopefully this can be a beacon for you to look out for these things. Um, if you are in that handful of people that, uh, that, that need it. Uh, cause you, sometimes you don't know until, until, until you have that light, come on so this could be your light and i think that uh you know perhaps when this oh, who knows we go back to normal but we may see some of the best improv of all time yeah or the worst but you know what i would rather see the worst than mediocre because i, I want to <laughs> see people so, so pent up so pent up because what Philippe taught me in that first session was this desire to be on stage, to have the pleasure 
to be on stage, the pleasure in the eyes. And if you didn't have the pleasure in your eyes when you enter the stage, you have to get the fuck off the stage because you're boring. And so people, we are going to be so hungry for human contact and human touch. And perhaps this time will will lead to a great revolution. And, you know, people just missing it so much that true love comes on. And we kind of, you know, it's not like fuck it to technique, but we enter this era of remember when we couldn't do that and now we can so let's just take every moment yeah. and just yeah. Fucking yeah. play hard truly a new no. movement am i right <laughs> oh, oh i see what you did there Ta. Yeah. um okay well th- i think i think those are our closing thoughts bob you got anything to close on no, just uh, honestly, this is not my my background. So just just listen to you guys. I, like honestly, yeah, but I, I've really enjoyed this. So thank cool. you guys. Um, okay, well, thanks again. Any any uh, last plugs you want to make, uh, Isaac, of, of things you're doing either online or um, in the virtual world uh, before we get back to normal? Well, I mean, uh, the Pack Theater in LA is doing a lot of a lot of shows all the time online. Check their stuff out. I've been on. Uh, uh, Rachel Resnick's anti-influencer hour. I think you can watch them. I- I'm doing a fun character called Aqua Ryan at the end of every show. It was a character I, <laughs> I don't want to say developed because he's just a really crazy European dude. Um, and uh, I mean, two men, no show. We might do our monthly party, hard, hard party online at some point. I mean, I think the beauty is that everything's available. So if you will miss it or never watch it, you can always just skip forward and fast forward everything now, which yeah. is great. So. If you don't, you don't watch it. If you don't like this conversation, you won't even be here right now. Skip it. Yeah. Skip it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You've already skipped it. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for having yeah. me, guys. One Love final you. thank you. And, Love you, Bo. Uh, thank you for having yeah. me. Love you too, buddy. Love you, buddy. Thanks for so joining us. So good to us. see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.